I had a clear vision of the type of writing that I wanted to do, and I knew it was possible. There just wasn't any board in existence that would allow me to do that. So I set out to create one that would. I'd always played around with riding my snowboard with my feet behind the bindings, just riding the metal slopes that we would encounter while hiking through the backcountry. That eventually led to removing the bindings and replacing them with stomp pads on split boards and snowboards back in the late 90s. It was good for a few laughs, but the snowboards just didn't work well enough for me to be able to take it very seriously. I had a blast playing around on snow skates when they came out around the year 2000, and they were great fun on packed slopes and spring conditions. But I really wanted to take bindingless riding into the conditions and the terrain that I loved most. I wanted to skate and surf powder. The easiest and most obvious first step was just to cut up the snowboards into new shapes and try to force them to work. After a couple of years of fighting with these cut up snowboards that didn't really work, I figured it would be better to just start from scratch. So in 2007, some friends and I started shaping and designing our own boards so we could have full control over the size, shapes, and profiles. Really get out there and figure out what works best. We played with all types of rockers and cambers and convex and concave bases, channels and fins. We did everything that we could think of that would affect the way the boards perform. Over the years, I'd learned that our boards needed to be much shorter than snowboards. They needed to float much better than snowboards as well. I shaped, tested, reshaped, and tested again. For three years, I was completely lost in my own world, just trying to figure this out. I was taking inspiration from a lot of different things. I was taking it from skateboarding, some things I'd learned from surfing, and, and years of snowboarding, and just kind of blending all those into one. Most of the boards we made didn't look anything like snowboards, and for good reason. These boards needed to perform much differently than a snowboard would in order to be able to ride them effectively without bindings. The PAL surfers that I was making performed way better than any snowboard that we'd ever tried without bindings. There was just no comparison. The boards were floating better than any snowboard I'd ever ridden in my life, and these same boards could be ridden with really good control and just a few inches of soft snow. It was so simple to just make turns I wanted to be able to ollie, I wanted to be able to spin and flip the board underfoot, really take advantage of the fact that you were unattached to the board. I didn't want to just mimic snowboarding. I wanted to experience new feelings and open up possibilities that had never been explored before in this environment. The boards were extremely agile, they floated really well, and you could ollie them. You could ride them forwards or backwards. They allowed us to do things that just weren't possible on snowboards. The boards themselves facilitated and inspired a whole new style of riding. It was so cool to go through that learning phase all on our own. We got to learn from our own experiences and learn from our own mistakes. And in the end, we wound up creating something that not only met our expectations, but far exceeded those expectations. In just a couple of years, how surfing came way beyond what we really thought was possible. We were having so much fun doing this. This had to get out. So after three years of dialing in boards, I decided to get focused and really make this happen, get it out there to the world.
When I started Grassroots Powder Surfing, we became the only company on the planet to sell something called a POW surfer. And nobody knew what this was, or how it worked, or what it was capable of. I had absolutely no budget, so I had to do everything myself. I designed, built, shaped, gripped the boards. I designed graphics, I made websites, and short films. I did anything I possibly could to get the word out about POW surfing. This is now a mountain I built on the ground. The autumn wind colors my skin. This has become my plan. I did my best to show people what was possible on these boards to show them that you didn't need any sort of ropes to help you turn. You didn't need any hooks to slide your feet under. You didn't need to use anything to try to get the board to stick to your feet. All you needed was a properly designed board, gravity, mountains, soft snow, and an open mind. Well, I think a lot of people could just see the soul in it and they could see how fun it was, and, and they could imagine the feelings that we'd been experiencing. It spread really quickly amongst the people who could see what this was all about. A couple of years after starting Grassroots Powder Surfing, I noticed there were some other guys developing their own types of bindingless powder boards in other parts of the world. There were the ASMO boards being developed in Austria, and in Japan they were building boards that they called Yukiita. The designs coming out of these places were really unique, and it was clear that they'd been developing them all on their own, just as I had for the past few years. It was great to see this binding free movement gaining momentum, and to see other people who were passionate and driven to create something that could bring more soul and variety back into snowboarding. been a natural progression to be at the point now where we're able to ride these like beautiful like custom boards that are meant for for powder surfing as opposed to these kind of ghetto rig snowboards that weren't really intended for riding without bindings. Once we found guys that were building these things uh, specifically for powder surfing that totally changed the game. Like power surfing on a fish snowboard or other wide small snowboard, it doesn't really work that good as a board specific made for power surfing, you know. It needs to be custom made for surfing the pow. It's a totally different shape from a typical snowboard. It requires a totally different set of skills, different equipment, and a whole new mindset. Once you've made that choice to go binding free, you've opened yourself up to a whole new world. I think it's very much harder. So after snowboarding for so many years, it's fun to come back to something that you really need to relearn and to keep falling and, and it's, it's good. Hopping on these other boards like the ASMO and the Yukiita was really cool for me as a rider and as a shaper. You know, I just love riding all different types of boards and the differences in the shapes and the designs makes a huge amount of difference, especially in powder conditions and especially without bindings.
、えっと、我もね、そうだしね。It just feels cooler to crank a turn with no bindings because you have to adjust your power a little different. You have to lean into it a little different. It's like you definitely use way more of your body. The turning is like surfing, and tricks are more like skating. And, but then you are on the snow, you know, so it's like all these mixes. Just fully free from the board, and and if you if you make one mistake, you're just going cartwheeling off the board. <laughs> That's what I, I like about it. It just adds that element of full-on challenge, you know. A little more freedom. You can move your feet around, and I don't know. You have to work harder on the turns, and it, I think the turns feels a little better too when you can snap them. It's like it's more it's closer to surfing and. You know, surfing is definitely one of the best things you can do. Power surfing just gives you a realistic surf experience. It's like the real thing. You're literally surfing snow. There's no attachment. There's no binding. There's no rope. There's no sky hook. It's like it's the real thing. You really are surfing snow. It's really progressive, in the sense that people are able to do things that have never been done before. In this environment, and at the same time, it pays tribute to the roots of snowboarding, and takes us back to before bindings really existed. The snurfer was invented by a fellow named Sherman Poppin back in the Midwest, and we didn't know much what they were doing with them back in the Midwest. We later came to find they had big competitions with snurfing. Most of it was just long downhill races. Ours became a little different sport to us because we wanted to take to the high mountains with them and, and get into the powder. From the very beginning, we tried to get as much powder in as we could. Just finding that was a, a lot more fun and freer being out in the powder than just sliding down the hard pack. There really weren't many people doing much out in the backcountry. Most were at the resorts, and so it was really different for them to see tracks coming down just a hillside. There would be people that would stop their cars. It would be a big crowd, and they would be looking up at us, wondering what in the world we were doing, because no one had ever seen anything like this before. It's probably the closest sensation I can think of to flying, because you would unweight and come out of those turns, and just it was like floating or flying down through the powder. We never really had that sort of sensation or experience before. We had a lot of fun skiing growing up, but、uh, on a powder day, I think either of us would have grabbed our snurfers、uh, in a heartbeat over our skis. There was just something about the simplicity of being able to grab your board and just escape to the outdoors without paying any kind of a lift ticket and just on your own ability climb up the mountain and then hop on your board and snurf back down. The closest thing that that resembles, really, in my mind, is is the slalom water ski that we had skied on all these years. Having the front strap, that sort of felt like something similar to slalom water skiing. It's very difficult to jump with these boards. We had to have some sort of a strap on the back in order to keep that back foot on, and then we could keep the front foot on by holding pressure with the rope against the snurfer. So you could stick your foot through the strap, and then it would hold your back foot on as you were going up into the air. There was part of us that wanted to ride it at the ski resort because we wanted to show everybody what we could do. But I don't think we would have traded that for being able to find the very best place on that particular day to do what we love doing. No crowds, no competition, just the sense of. Getting the most out of、uh, the beautiful area that we live in. Talking with Buck and Hawkeye about their past was really enlightening. It was just like sitting down with old friends. The feelings and experiences that they described were just like what I'd experienced for the past few years pow surfing. They were using a different tool, and we came from different backgrounds and influences, but we had the same basic goal. It was really cool because for them there was no competition, there was no race, there was no scene. It was just about being out in the backcountry and pushing their personal limits and seeing what was possible. 
And they were doing it in the terrain and in the conditions that gave them the best feelings. And that's exactly what powder surfing is all about. Well, the beauty of powder surfing is you don't really need like the biggest slope to have a lot of fun. It just makes smaller mountains more interesting. It's like you jump five meters, it's suddenly like, it feels big again. <laughs> It gives you a challenge, you know, that it is technical and makes the hills more fun again. When you don't have bindings, everything is, is an, un, under a new eye. Smaller features and just little bumps to jump or smaller little lines to try to get into. It adds a whole element of difficulty to mellow terrain for me. And without getting myself in severe avalanche conditions, I can go out and push myself and still have a lot of fun. If you go to Alaska and you have the gnarliest peak, I would definitely pick a snowboard. You know, but I can also, if I was there with two boards, I'd go like, okay, I'm going to do this line here with my snowboard and jump these cliffs and haul ass. But then I'm going to go to the right and just do this open feel with this easy corners with no bindings. I definitely think the potential to do a lot of cool things, strapless. For the first few years of developing the grassroots boards, we just played around on the smaller slopes. We never imagined that we could have so much fun on such small terrain. We figured it out on the smaller stuff, dialed it in, then took it to the bigger terrain. That's when everything just came together and things started to get pretty rad. Conditions are proper, you can pretty much take those things anywhere a snowboard can go. It just depends on how much you want to risk it. <laughs> it's more risky going on big mountains. You definitely have to think a little differently because if you have to run away from an avalanche or you lose your board. It's really been quite the transition, you know, going from more of a playful childhood goofing off in the snow type thing to actually go and charge big mountains that are serious and that have consequences. I think anyone who skis and snowboards in big mountains knows the feeling you get when you nail a big line. And when the conditions are right to be able to pull that off completely binding free, that feeling is as amazing as it gets.
、まあ、ちょっとずっと雪板っていうのを乗ってて、まあ、1人で最初やってたんだけど昨日一緒にあのセッションしたタスクを興味,興味持ってくれて長野の特徴で言えばあのタイトですごいあの細かい釣りとかタイトなシュートとか沢とかが結構多いんでそういうのに合わせて作ってるのかな。えー、雪板初めて見たのが、えー、原点ボールであっちゃんが持っててそれで最初に見たのがそれだったんだけど、まあ、その後林業をやるようになってそれで自分で作るようになったって感じですねでこの短い太いのを作ったらこのなんか踏めなくてなんてやってるうちにどんどんシェイプの形も決まってきてでもやっぱりサーフボードとかスケートボード見るといろんなイメージいろんな枠っすねあといろんな人シェイプしてる人に会うとすごいいろんなアイディアもらえます。The boards that Atsushi and Tasuku were making were these beautifully crafted all wood boards and you could just tell that they cared so much about this piece of art that they were making and that they were going to be riding. Being able to ride in Japan was a dream come true for me. And to be able to go out there and to meet up with Atsushi and Tasuku and session with those guys was just amazing. I couldn't have asked for a better time. The snow in Japan was so light and dry, and the terrain there was so technical, and so many tight trees and, and bumps to jump off everywhere. And it was, man, it was so much fun. I was in heaven up there, man. That place was just amazing. These guys had so much soul and rode with so much style and grace. It was, it was really inspiring. It made for some of the best sessions I've ever had in my life. Just the attitudes and the vibe and the terrain we were riding in the snow. You know, I don't speak a word of Japanese and they didn't speak any English. We were communicating through pure stoke and just high fives and smiles. It was just like any other day riding with your best friends. Like these guys were just awesome. It was an experience I'll never forget. みんなの滑り見た時はあのキックがあってすごいスケートライクに滑っててそれがすごい羨ましかったんだけどいつもはスケートのダウンヒルのカービングのイメージはすごい板にくるでもみんなみたいにあんなオーリーできるようなイメージは今まであんまなかったから今日はすげえみんなとセッションできてすげえ面白かった。のいいとこ滑れたし、今日もなんだかんだいいとこ滑れたし、すげえ楽しかったです。ね、ジェレミーもね、うまいし、氷とかね、あんな飛べるんだって。<笑>で自分のまあ理想で言えば、ジェレミーみたいにフリップとか<笑>なんか技までで、自然地形の中で技とかできたら。なって思ってるよね<笑>でねあの合流して山に向かって「もうすげえパウダーだよ」って言ってねみんなでセッションね念願のセッションだったからすごいなんかもう気持ちが上がっちゃっててずっと。なんか<笑>やけに<笑>本当にずっとみんなでセッションしたいなって思ってたからそれがね本当に現実的にこうやって来てくれてみんなで滑って。
the Japanese riders really understood and appreciated bindingless riding for what it is. They had no interest at all in anything that would take away from a true binding free experience. It was all about balance and skill and flowing with the mountain. They wanted to experience the real thing. I'm really looking to get away when I'm on my powder surfer, you know. I'm looking for like the most pristine conditions, the most epic place to, to do this, you know. And I'm not going to find that at a ski resort. There's just no way. Even if I get the first chair and I'm the first one down, maybe I have one good run and that's it, you know. You've really got to hike to a zone that's going to uh, suit your needs, that or a, a snowmobile. I prefer the snowshoe method. and. Just being able to trudge around and look up to a zone and say, oh, I want to surf down that. It really feels like you're surfing, just walking around and, and uh, getting into position to drop into these lines. It takes a trained eye, I guess you could say. A good rule of thumb is just to hike from the bottom up and then you can really assess it out as you go. And just the more and more you do it, the more, the more you can feel what's going to work and what's not going to work. I think if you get rid of the bindings, you realize how many different types of snow there is. I don't think in snow of inches anymore. Inches are like the stock market reading. It doesn't tell you really what's going on. It's, it's everything. It's the wind. It's the aspect. It's the trees. It's the, you know, the weather before, the weather after. If I compare pow surfing to split boarding, you can get way more bang for your buck, I think, with a pow surf because you don't have to make any transitions or anything and you don't have all this gear that like has to go back together and you can kind of just run up a mountain and slide back down and just do that time after time after time and it just kind of simplifies everything and brings it back to the roots of just hiking around and enjoying, enjoying the outdoors and the less gear you have, the less cluttered your life is really, and that's the way to do it. You know, doing the skiing thing as a professional um, is, is incredibly fun, but I've never been one to kind of limit myself. I've always enjoyed to experience all the different ways to have fun out there, and there's no question that powder surfing offers up the most freedom and the most opportunities for self-expression out of all of the different forms of snow sliding. I think it's the most pure form of mountain riding that exists. You interact with the elements on a more intimate basis. Uh, you feel the snow under your feet. You, know, you feel the mountain and the, and the contours. Uh, it's not just barreling down the mountain like you would on a snowboard. You really have to assess the terrain and and, uh, and you really have to feel what's going on underfoot to be able to make your turns and, and make your judgments. Once you uh, drop in on a slope, there's really no turning back. Just kind of like surfing how if, once you paddle in and stand up, you're like at the mercy of the wave. And it's the same way with, with uh, surfing the pow because once you drop in, you're definitely at the mercy of the mountain at the point. That I love, you know, riding hard and going big and stuff, but, you know, you beat yourself up without crashing. And that's like, you can stomp everything on a snowboard and like you say, come home and you didn't crash, but you still beat the hell out of yourself. If I go strapless, I can definitely cruise more and not be so sore the next day and still have the same kind of technical abilities on doing stuff. I do kick flips or burials and power surfers. And that's just as hard as doing double back, cork. I wanted to bring skate style riding into the backcountry because it had never been there before. I just saw it as a new way to take the progression of snow sports to a different level. The backcountry is just like the world's biggest skate park. There's endless features everywhere you turn. And it just made perfect sense to want to skate that skate park. It's hard and that's why you want to keep doing it so when you do learn something or you make a 
flawless run than without falling and that's when it feels good because otherwise if it wasn't hard, you know, it would be gratifying really. I think things are a little more difficult, you appreciate it a lot more when you actually start to master it or having fun with it. When it finally pays off for you, the challenges that you went to get to that payoff, the greater those challenges, the bigger the payoff. You know, if you had to fight harder for it, it's going to taste that much sweeter. Taking the bindings out of the equation just enhances the entire experience. It makes every turn feel better. It makes every jump feel higher. It makes every mountain feel bigger. It just makes everything more challenging. And with a greater challenge, there's a greater reward. Pow surfing has given us a way to interact with our environment that requires more of a challenge and more of a refined focus and skill. It's opened up a whole new avenue for style and progression and self-expression. having no restrictions and having no rules, having no trails. You just kind of choose your own path and choose your own style of doing it. So many possibilities for, you know, allowing your creativity to just flow and it's just an exceptional feeling. something I feel like I've been working towards my whole life. It's been so fun to take all the skills that I've learned over the past two decades through skateboarding and snowboarding and surfing, and just kind of blend them into one. And these cultures have given me so much over my lifetime. I'm just really stoked to be a part of giving something back. Surfing makes me feel like a kid again. It's given me a whole new rebirth of stoke. It's that same stoke I had when I was in my teens learning to skateboard and snowboard. To be able to experience those feelings again in such an incredible environment, it's just unreal. Skateboarders have always ridden the streets binding free. Surfers ride the waves binding free. Why not take snowboarding back to the roots and really experience the possibilities and the feelings that come with riding mountains without any bikes?
Yeah. 